and five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Relators Podcast. Two and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is the CEO of Tomorrow, global futurist keynote speaker and author of The Algorithmic Leader. It's Mr. Mike Walsh. Mike, thanks for being with us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Well, Mike, it's funny. You know, we've, we've got this email that we send out to let our audience know, you know, about the upcoming podcast. And, you know, in the email, I was like, all right, well, Hey, you know, send us some questions for Mike if you have any. Uh, there's currently fires going on in my home state of, Port- of, of Oregon and California. Hey, if you know anybody that needs help, let me know. I can send out a message. I got a few responses, Mike, but one I got was from Chuck2021, and he said, get a haircut. You look like a girl. So I don't know if he was talking about me, if he was talking about you, but um, Chuck, man, sorry. Given that my hair is twice as long as yours, I, I think I'm the one in trouble. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, California is not allowing haircuts either. I just don't think this guy understands. <laughs> but uh, you know, Mike, it's funny. You know, I, I think you, you'd really like a mo- like a real life like Keanu Reeves, like a like a Neo. You know, what I'm saying like, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll I'll be a you know the Mister Agent, and we'll can bring a we can bring Trinity in here, and we'll just have a party. Just don't mess with my dog. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, what about parties though? Parties that. We're not invited to this day of digital disruption, 5G coming out, um, iPhones with billion tra- uh, billion transitors in them that we just have no idea about, but they're in the p- palm of our hands. Where are we currently in this day and age and, and really in the uh, grand scheme of things? Uh, look, I think in many ways, uh, uh, 2020 is, is kind of a dress rehearsal for the next 10 years. So what, what we're seeing in this year is everything that we're going to see a dramatic acceleration of very shortly, whether it's home delivery, greater use of automation, uh, you know, our, our total reliance on mobile technology, uh, and even finally a boom in virtual reality, which is something that, you know, didn't go anywhere until this year when everyone was stuck inside and suddenly started buying these headsets. So we're really getting a preview now of the world that's coming um, that's actually been accelerated in many ways. Yeah. So uh, explain what is VR? What is extended reality? Yeah. So extended reality or XR encompasses VR, AR, or MR. MR is mixed reality. So you're seeing, um, you know, from uh, manufacturers like Microsoft, this idea that, you know, not just putting you in a virtual world, but superimposing images over your vision. So you could be a a mechanical engineer in a factory who has to repair something and you're seeing schematics appear in front of your vision, which guide you through the process. And the difference between MR and AR is that in MR, the system is actually aware of what it sees. So if you're playing Pokemon, for example, the little Pokemon will see the flower pot and will know that it can actually hide behind it. So it's much more immersive. And these technologies are not only dramatically improving because we've got better chips, better computation. When you now throw 5G and AI into the mix, uh, they really have the potential to transport our perspective. So you make a claim in the book, Mike, about, you know, like, like I just mentioned, the party we're not invited to. It's coming and leaders in today's day and age have to be aware of what algorithms do. Explain to our audience what an algorithm is and how to think like an algorithmic leader. Uh, An algorithm is actually something that's been around for thousands of years. Uh, Probably the simplest example of an algorithm is a recipe, like a cooking recipe. So it's a series of steps you follow to get a result. Now, of course, in the 21st century we live in, these instructions are not only embedded everywhere, machines have started to learn to actually be able to create them themselves. So when people talk about machine learning, that's really machines in a way writing their own algorithms. And it's sort of weird, like we're seeing algorithms become not only critical to the way we design experiences, but they're going to be the future of business as well and the, the battles that are bought. Uh, you've probably been looking in the press recently, there's been a big controversy over um, TikTok and ByteDance. Uh, if you if if you 
if you've got kids, you probably already know what TikTok is. Uh, if you're an adult and you know what it is, you probably shouldn't be using it. It's not for you. Uh, but the genius of TikTok is that they've essentially weaponized algorithms to know exactly what to show you next to keep you hooked. Mm. And it's no accident. They study, you know, trillions of data points in order to be able to know exactly what to show you to keep you engaged. But here's the interesting thing. If you've been watching this whole debate about who in the US can, gets to take control of, of uh, TikTok, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, is actually not going to share its algorithm. So whoever invests in them in the US or if Oracle takes them over, the algorithm is going to be kept secret. And that shows you where value is really in the 21st century. The most valuable thing a company has are its data and its algorithms. Now, what are your thoughts or perspective on what that does in the long term for society? Well, it, it changes the kind of debates that we're that we have to have. Um, you know, almost every aspect of our lives will be shaped by algorithms. And this is controversial. Uh, access to welfare, access to housing, insurance companies will use sophisticated algorithms to determine your premiums and risk. Uh, even in education, uh, they're now the future classroom will use algorithms to actually judge what where your child is at. Um, can we adapt the learning and personalize it for them? So the most almost every experience we have, uh, whether it's watching television or buying books or shopping or learning or interacting with other people will be shaped by these invisible lines of code. And what's really going to be difficult is that in many cases, humans will not understand completely how those algorithms were designed. So if you're a business leader, this is the moment where you've got to make sure you're upgrading your own knowledge and capabilities. Because claiming to not understand this, you're going to be on the hook for it as a leader. You're going to be not only accountable, but you're going to be liable for the algorithms that your organization uses to design experiences for your customers. So I've had a few people say, never make an emotional decision. You know, Always trust in the data. Where do you fall in that? And what is the difference between an algorithm making a decision versus a human? It's a great question. And in a way, we've got this difficult choice. You can either have a human being making a unpredictable decision, which can depend on, as you say, their emotions, the weather, the time of day. Or you can have a machine which can predictably make an unfair decision <laughs> if the data it, that it's based on is biased or discriminatory. So what that tells you is not that machines are biased or there's a risk of discrimination. It shows you that the most important thing you do when you design a machine to make decisions is that the data that you use is clean, correct, and the algorithms are non-discriminatory. And if you cannot understand the algorithm, you at least need to understand what the system is optimized to do. Is it optimized to save money? Is it being optimized uh, for growth? Is it being optimized to create the best possible experience uh, for the user? You need to know what that trade-off is because in every system, there's a trade-off. Now, let's go into the actual companies that are making these decisions. Uh, you mentioned in your book, and I'm just going to show your book really quick for people out here listening to this. I just think it's so great. It's, a, it's like dessert for me. You know, I've got... It's a nice mindset book I've got right in front of me, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. We had him on the show. We first with Simon Manwaring talk about brands and its ultimate purpose. But this book, you know, I'm, I'm not a big tech guy at all, Mike, and as you can tell by this interview, but I really like it's, it's just like a dessert for me. It's, it's nice. It's edible. It's fun. And it really makes you think differently and about the future. And I can go into that a little bit later. But sticking to this example, you mentioned a few companies in the book. Let's take Amazon, for example. How are they using algorithms in their decision making and design thinkings when it comes to, let's just say, a personal meeting? Well, what, what makes Amazon really interesting as a company is that it's not just that they have such a massive investment in, in technology. So they're, they're no longer a retailer. They're a, provi they're a platform that provides cloud computation. They provide the big infrastructure that runs the world. But to me, what makes them really interesting is not so much all of that technology. It's their culture 
their values, and their organizational principles. You know, one of the most interesting things that you can look at if you want to learn more about Amazon is their leadership principles. Because what they've realized is that if you want to be an effective leader in this new world, it's not just what you know, and, and, and uh, it's how you think. It's how you solve problems. It's how you interact. This is like the cultural operating system inside the company. And it's not something you can go and buy from a technology vendor. You have to figure out what is the smartest way for our best people to interact and collaborate and get things done. So I'll give you, I'll give you one simple example. The way Amazon runs meetings. And this, obviously this was before COVID. And they've, they banned PowerPoint in their meetings. Now, you might think that sounds insane, right? Or maybe it sounds wonderful. I mean, I don't know about you. I've had hours of my life lost to completely inane PowerPoint presentations. But you might not like what they do instead. If you want to get a decision made in Amazon, you've got to go in with a maximum six-page memo. It's highly structured. It states the problem, the hypothesis, uh, any attempts the company's made in the past to, you know, to deal with this decision, who, who, what they, what they came up with, and a stack of data to support the decision you're trying to make. So, uh, Amazon realizes that to succeed in this new environment, you actually need a very different approach to making decisions that's ultimately data driven. When it comes to supportive data. How does one make sure that they aren't finding data that just justifies their hypothesis? For instance, if I was creating an online course, I could go out and say, oh, look, you know, COVID's happening right now. 43% of schools are opening up online. 26 are only in person. I'm going to make a nice course for frustrated virtual teachers to, you know, help uh, engage students. How does my data uh, research um, make sure that I'm not supporting my own hypothesis? You know, as the saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And uh, that's exactly the issue with data. You can find data that supports your hypothesis if you're taking that, you know, deduction-driven approach. We actually need to be more inductive. So we have to look at the data and go, okay, what is this data telling us about a reality that we hadn't seen before? And as you say, that's that's it's not the it's not that we that data is important. It's the way we use data that's critical. So weirdly, to be data driven is to be more open minded. It's to be humble enough to realize that your first intuition may very well be wrong. And actually, we need to ultimately be more more probabilistic rather than deterministic. Uh, I'll explain the difference. So. You know, in many cases, human beings are wired to be deterministic. And when I say deterministic, if this happens, then this must be the reason or this is the result. And we're wired this way for survival. I mean, you think about it, if you're on the savanna and you, you know, you see some wild animal or a tiger, you don't have time to kind of think, wow, I wonder if that tiger's friendly or not, or, you know, right. maybe we can be friends, right? You just run. So this kind of instant response. But in this new world that we're in, things are not so black and white. And is a is a competitor a competitor or are they a, a, a potential partner? Can you be partners with them sometimes and competitors with them in other markets? Uh, is this series of events happening going to be good or bad for the business? Um, what's the right ethical decision to make in, in this scenario? And what you realize in a world of increasing levels of uncertainty, ambiguity, and lots of data is that we need to be able to update our beliefs as we get more information. This is called being probabilistic. Hmm. So in a key business decision, you may only be 70% sure. Now, you need to ask yourself at what point, at what level of certainty can I act? So is this a decision where I need to be 90% sure or is 50% okay? And as you get more information, does that make you more or less certain? So that way, as new data comes in, you're updating your views, not trying to look to see whether they fit your thesis or theory about reality. So is that more like risk? You said risk aversion in the book, right? Uh, having machines and algorithms predict based on prior events. Is that correct? No, it, it's it's more about our, our mindset to change and, and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if you're if you're somebody who, as you say, tends to look for data to fit your view, you're actually someone who can't handle uncertainty very well. You know, you've got your idea about the way things should be, and you're looking for data to support it. But if you're more open to ambiguity, you're actually seeing more data as a way of changing your, your views or seeing whether they, you know, you're being ready to move and adjust. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, the head of engineering at Airbnb. He was talking about the kinds of people that he likes to hire. And he says, in the end, I look for people that are comfortable with ambiguity, highly tolerant of ambiguity, because those kinds of people are the people who, as things are constantly changing, see it as a challenge. They don't see it as a threat. They actually embrace the the uncertainty of events. Now, why do you think so many people seem, see machines and big data as threats as opposed to something that's going to create more jobs, lower the cost, improve our way of living? Why do you think that is? We've always, I think as human beings, been fearful of the very tools we've, we have ourselves built. You know, there's, if you look at it, you know, for hundreds of years, actually right back to the ancient Greeks, you know, they even had an idea, almost this idea of robots, you know, or golems or things that are inanimate coming to life, threatening us. And if, if you look more closely, though, um, we don't always need to be trying to prove that we're better than our machines. You think about John Henry, you, you know, trying to, you know, take on the, the mechanical system. Because human beings co-evolve with technology. So as we get better tools, we realize that our value is staying one step ahead of the tools because the tools allow us to do things we couldn't do before. Um, we don't have to go back to a world without computers or without typewriters or without hammers or, or without machine learning and automation. So all of these things just allow people to focus on what's really important and what's really a value. So the question we have to ask ourselves is not, will technology destroy jobs? The key question is, how will technology change jobs? How does it change what it means to be valuable? How does it change what it means to be an effective leader? And that's actually something that's speeding up now because the rate of improvement is growing so exponentially. We have to be prepared as leaders to be constantly re-educating, retraining, and resetting our expectations about where we can add the most value. And that's why I'm really excited about the future because there's so many things we do every day which human beings shouldn't do administrative, routine, transactional tasks. Actually, our real job is not to work. Our real job is to design work. Hmm. So we should be every day going to work going, how can I destroy my own job? Is there a way that I can leverage technology that means that my job today doesn't need to exist? Now, you might think, why on earth would you be so crazy to do that? And it's actually because in that moment, you are showing how valuable you are as a human being because you are designing systems that scale up your function, which means that was actually your whole job in the first place. Do you think that's at the core of most tech leaders' purpose is to make life easier, to make sure we don't have to work one day? Uh, I don't think it's on enough leader's agenda. Uh, I think for too long, um, technology and technology investment has been flowing into these micro conveniences that suit sort of the West Coast, San Francisco tech entrepreneurs, right? So there's this, there's sort of a bubble in Silicon Valley about people looking for these little micro shared economy conveniences. And I think the futility of that was really made clear in 2020 because despite the fact it's been a hundred years since we have had to deal with a mass pandemic like this. You go back to the images of 1918, and aside from the black and white, it's shocking how similar they are. We still have signs up saying stay away from each other. We're still wearing the same kind of masks. We're still using the brute, blunt tool of quarantine, you know, to, to deal with this. And what that shows you is that despite all of the technological advances, We've spent too much time on things that probably don't matter that much, like mm. social media, like games, 
like you know micro transactions micro apps that really may, maybe bring small conveniences but they haven't fundamentally improved our logistics our ability to develop new medicines ability to to really drive health results and outcomes well what would you like to see then and what are some uh developments that have come from the recent pandemic well you know we used to talk about digital disruption you know as a concept and people used to believe that to be a digital disruptor, there had to be something different about you. I don't know, like uh, somehow only if you worked at a company like Airbnb, Uber, there was something magical in the coconut water in their offices, right? That gave you the ability to be a disruptor. Then 2020 arrived and we realized that there's no, no, no longer any such thing as digital disruption. There's just being in business or not in business. We, we all had to become disruptors. If you were digital, it wasn't special anymore. You were just finding a way to still deal with your customers. So I think what's become very clear is that every business, every industry, every leader has no longer the luxury of time to wait on digital transformation. Mm. Um, but it's no longer that special anymore. It's just the price of doing business. Now the interesting question is, what is real disruption? What can we do now that we could never have done before we lived in a world of machine intelligence? How do we think beyond just creating a digital channel for customers to deal with us and think how do we fundamentally reimagine the experience for our customers, whether you're a store or a healthcare provider or an insurer uh, or someone in logistics and transportation? I think what's made this made clear is that we now need to really tap into our imagination. Well, let's, let's go there then let's hypothesize a little bit, Mike, what does the future of work look like to you? And when someone says future of work, how far out is that? Well, let me tell you the future of work is, is a lot more than zoom. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's and this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, I think people got very excited realizing that they could now do video conferencing. It, you know, I came, I was doing some research on this and um, I came across a picture from 1930. It was a pr early uh, prototype video conferencing booth from AT&T, 1930. In fact, even in 1960, they had this technology. They've been trying to push video conferencing, you know, for almost the last 90 years, long before the internet. And the thing about it is, is that the technology itself is not really the important part. The important part is how do we find a new way of working? Because what we've done now is terrible. We've just taken all our bad practices from 2019. Think of all of the endless meetings you were stuck in. And now we've just moved them onto a screen with a camera that's constantly watching your face. Right. I mean, there's a reason why people have this sense of anxiety because you're liking this panopticon of being constantly watched and, you know, having to deal with your resting zoom face, you know, like what's my expression at all times. So I, I think what we need to figure out as we start to go back to the office, the question is not, should we work at home or should we work at the office? The question is, does it matter where we are? Can we find a way of working that's location independent, that it doesn't require us to sit through endless video calls, but there's sort of a seamless interchange between how we interact with other people in our organization, whether they're in the head office, whether they're at home, whether they're a full-time person or they're a freelancer. Like how do we better design the ecosystem of talent in our organizations and also design around, around that new ways of tracking work, running projects, um, uh, documenting decisions. And, and this is what I think people miss is that this 2020 crisis has just broken the mold, but we're a long way yet from rebuilding the organization of the future. Now let's just pause for a second, Mike, and just remember that we are only human. And I don't know if you agree with this quote, but technology is only adopted at the rate of trust. So if we're going to get to where you're saying we're going to get to, and if we're going to follow this reverse engineering 
methodology that you kind of lay out in the book. How can a leader listening to this hypothesize and then work backwards uh, to achieve a result? I I think the starting point for for any leader is to is to start with a clean sheet of paper and say, okay, you know, at every level of this organization, from the way I deal with my customers to the way I deal with my partners to the way I deal with my team and even what I do myself, what is the new smart way of doing things? You know, is there a better way uh, of doing this? And and what does this crisis teach me about the future that I had not? paid attention to i mean that to me is that is the almost the daily reflection that leaders need need to to focus on because you know even even at the level of the people around you the people that are handling this crisis best in your team are the people you want to keep close to you in the future Mm -hmm. because we are going to live in a decade of of radical change not just crisis like the one we're in now but this process of constant reinvention and, and, and reflection is going to be something that the best people are going to be, are going to be good at. So I, I think that, that for me is really the starting point. Um, and this is the future of work is, is going to be a journey. It's not a template or a blueprint. And it's not going to be the same for everyone. But it's it's uh, let's say a, a one part of it is learning how to harness technology, automation, artificial intelligence um, to do things that either we can't do or we shouldn't do. Hmm. But the other, much more important part, is how do we unlock the real latent capabilities of people? You know, what are the things that we can do that machines can't do? How do we really tap into that creative imagination? design-driven approach um, that allows people to really have much more interesting, fulfilling work. I think uh, exactly, yes. And in terms of the centralization you mentioned earlier, empowering other leaders, those people that are performing best right now are the people you want to be hiring. Now, decentralization is a topic we talk about often on the show. How can you empower the leaders and so they can lead their own? Like a starfish, you cut a leg off, it's going to grow back, right? That type of thinking... What explain the term holacracy to me? I just got to this chapter on uncertainty. Explain (laughs) what holacracy is to our audience right now and how it is adaptive for a company structuring to scale um, in in an algorithmic way, I guess. Strangely enough, uh, holacracy to me is a, a bit of a dead end. So the idea in holacracy is that you have no job titles. Um, that you have a very rigid framework that governs interactions and and governs the way you have meetings. So in a way, they've got rid Mm -hmm. of one kind of structure, which is hierarchical titles, department silos, and they create another architecture, which is more like a a computer operating system, you know, where, uh, you know, there are cycles and circles and people have different functional roles. Um, So it's a much more distributed structure. Uh, the, the key essence and philosophies behind holacracy are, are ingenious, but we don't need to necessarily adopt that technical, rigid approach. The, so for me, the, the interesting question is, how do you design an organization that's truly distributed? So it's not remote or a, a work from home organization. How do you design an organization where you have uh, small, agile, empowered teams that are able to focus and drill down on problems, but that their activities are also folded up into higher units um, of of organization um, so that you get the balance between tactical problems and big strategy and vision. And this is really, I think, you know, long before the pandemic, the world's smartest organizations have been trying to use these more agile uh, environments to work. Uh, So take Marcus by Goldman Sachs which is a, you know, has been a very successful experiment for that bank. It's a, it's a retail bank run by software. They still have employees, but everyone at Marcus, regardless of their functional role, whether they work in marketing or legal, um, actually are a part of a dedicated pod, they call it, or work stream. So it might be um, onboarding a new customer 
or the resetting your password journey. It could be a problem, a pain point, an opportunity. So that really focuses as an agile group your what actually drives the content of your deliverable. And being able to break the organization down into those sort of work streams rather than these functional departments is a great example of a more distributed environment for being customer centric. Do you think we'll see more distributed networks, more decentralization? And what are your thoughts on, let's just say, blockchain? Well, to, to the first part of your question, um, I think we will absolutely see more distributed organizations. Uh, in fact, the whole remote working experiment has shown that we don't have the time to try to centralize management and that you have to trust people to do their work. But if you're going to do it, you need really good data, really good collaboration models and 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 ways for people to track what's being done. The next layer to your question, of course, is is where does that go from here? So I think whole parts of the organization will become more automated, will have more smart contracts, um, maybe your procurement or your logistics function, parts of that will become autonomous and driven by uh, blockchain type smart contracts. Uh, your finance team will have a kind of a decentralized, decentralized finance component that handles the way that they you know, deal with commodity pricing or uh, contracts or hedging functions. So this is this is just the kind of the logical path, I think, where you're you're rather than using contracts in the traditional sense, you're actually building intelligence and code and triggers into those relationships between entities, between organizations, between customers and suppliers. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you don't need people in those areas. I mean, those people actually could become more important. They're the people designing these smart contracts and these uh, smart arrangements. It, but it just means you don't have all the people in the back office now who are kind of checking contracts, filling in triplicate forms, uh, you know, l looking for errors. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different skill set. So automation at, at this point in stage, you say it will create more jobs, but at the end, it will eliminate work itself virtually. Well, we're going to go through this this moment. It's like someone's taken the snow dome and shaken it. So this is going to be a rough ride for the next few years because there's no doubt that automation is going to rationalize a lot of jobs. Um, it's going to create a lot of jobs for people that are driving the transition. And on the other side, it's going to create new types of jobs that never existed before. But if you're somebody who says, I refuse to change what I do and I don't want to learn anything new, then it's going to be difficult. And one of the things I fear most is a polarization in society. Mm. So people talk a lot about, uh, you know, algorithmic discrimination. So they're worried about AIs and algorithms being discriminatory. Mm. What really worries me is AI inequality, where we end up in a society where essentially there's three kinds of people. There's this mass algorithmic underclass of people that are really just working for algorithms. So think of Uber drivers today. You don't work for a human. You work for some lines of code that it's managing your schedule, that's tracking your performance. Um, so whether you're driving a car, you're delivering a box, you're stacking a shelf, you're actually working for an algorithm. So that's not a great place to be <laughs> because, you know, for lots of reasons, it's highly competitive. There's not a lot of room for growth. There's very little room for learning because your boss is actually not even human. You're not going to get any kind of useful feedback or prospects for advancement. Then you've got a, a kind of a new professional class that these are the people who have the education, the experience to actually work on and design algorithms and algorithmic systems. So this is kind of the new like let's say upper middle class of professionals. Then you have a tiny, almost aristocratic class of the uber wealthy, the people who actually own these algorithms and the systems and the platforms, whose wealth will completely, you know, dwarf anything we've seen as of yet today. And you've mm. seen a number of individuals in the pandemic whose wealth has increased exponentially. I'll tell you why this scares me. That's a recipe for revolution. Sure. Always has been. So I, I think the only way we can address this is not through regulation or taxation, 
we have to essentially reboot education and training, not just for kids, but for adults to prepare people for this, you know, the skills they're going to need for this new world. That's what I was just about to ask you. Let's work backwards. Education, how does it change? Where are some of the steps we need to take to educate leaders or at least uh, inform the, the next generation of leaders to think in this way so something like this does not happen? Well, there's, if you think that our goal as a society or as an organization should be moving people out of category one, working for algorithms into category two at least, um, which is having the skills to really be effective in an algorithmic organization, then there's two problems we need to solve simultaneously. The people that are growing up today and the people inside the workforce now. Uh, so for the people growing up today, we need to really accelerate not just how we use AI in education, which has been a big focus, like how do we you know, uh, create more scale and efficiency in schools, we have to figure out what are the core set of skills and capabilities that kids are going to need in this new world. Now, we know for sure it's not teaching them social media, right, because they're better at it than us. It may not even be just teaching programming because programming languages change all the time. In fact, it may actually be that rather than teaching people what to think, we have to get better at teaching people how to think. So how do you leverage computational thinking? How do you get better at pulling problems apart and then kind of thinking about the problem in, in a kind of a meta way and then applying automation and technology to help you scale the solution? So this kind of new cognitive stack should be the new reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, of, of education mm. um, because whatever field you, your kid's going to go into, Maybe they want to be an archaeologist. Uh, maybe they want to be an astronomer. Maybe they want to be a doctor. There's something that's similar to all of those prof professions. They're going to be changed by machine intelligence. We're going to have computational astronomers, computational, um, I almost said uh, computational astrologers, but we'll probably have those too, um, computational accountants. So every field is going to be changed mm. by AI and technology. But the other half, which is the workforce, this is going to be big. You know, you're already today seeing the world's biggest organizations ex aggressively retraining their people. And it's because they know if they don't do that, they're not going to have even themselves the skills that they need in, to, to compete. Now, Mike, how does one think outside the box? You mentioned reflection a few times. Uh, I know Steve Jobs and a few others' uh, ideas have come from out of nowhere. Uh, Tesla is big in the meditation. Buddhism, uh, psychedelics has been a, a way to to think <laughs> outside the box, and it, it it just is what it is. So, how does one think outside of the box to uh, change their mind or train their mind to think differently? I I, I think there's no one uh, there's no one path to that. I mean, to me, one of the most uh, valuable things about this current revolution we're living through is that if we can automate more of the routine transactional parts of our job, then we have more time for reflection and for kind of clearing our slate and, and trying to, you know, see through the immediate crisis, whatever that might be. You know, um, Bill Gates famously has his Think Week, you know, where he'd go away into the into the woods with a stack of books. And, and I mean, it was the most important part of his year, mm. you know, where he would take memo. Even when he was actually working at Microsoft, he would take, you know, a, a handful of memos that he, people had written for him. And he would really think deeply about the future of the industry and the future of this company. Mm. That's an extreme example. But carving out that time for yourself as a leader and for your team, where you can actually just go, okay, let's forget everything that's on our immediate horizon. What are we missing? What is now possible that wasn't possible before? How can we reframe the problem? Um, how do we challenge our own orthodoxies, the things that we thought are impossible to change? Uh, what's happening in other industries? Uh, because the strange thing is now there's much more convergence between industries the, the, the things that are changing in the in the logistics industry are affecting what's happening in the entertainment industry. And it's because the underlying base is changing for all of us. 
which is greater use of AI algorithms and automation. And so there's opportunities for inspiration everywhere. Mike, uh, you got me watching Star Trek Next Generation. I'm not even kidding on Netflix. How, how on earth could you blame uh, me for that? It, 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 you know, I'm just going to blame <laughs> you, okay? I just started reading your book, and I'm like, you know, maybe I should watch something different. And so I just started watching this. And Data is, I don't know if you've seen it or not, I'm sure you have. Data is the character in, in you know, Star Trek that isn't a human. Yet he is a cyborg. He is a, a, a person, or not you know, a robot person, essentially, 1998, however you want to say that. Um, he is not a, he, he is a sentient being, but he lacks two things. He lacks humor. So he's always trying to make funny jokes, but he can't. And he lacks love. Do you think, uh, AI or computers, robots in the future will ever be sentient beings that will acquire personality traits such as love or humor? He also lacks decent skin and, and, and a reasonable pair of contact lenses. That's right. Um, the question of what is what is human is is going to be a, something that's going to be harder and harder to answer. Hmm. You know, if you if you go back, uh, you know, uh, uh, right back to Turing, Alan Turing, the, one of the founders of the computer world yeah, that we live in today. Yeah. You know, he proposed this test. You know, which is the Turing test about whether or not you could. T you know, uh, if you put two people talking together whether you or if someone could not determine whether the other person speaking to them was actually um, a robot or a human mm. that, that was a kind of a sign of intelligence it's easy to beat those tests today and in fact one of the most interesting new uh developments is something that open ai came up with called gpt3 it's a uh, it's called a text it's a text transformer basically what it does is it's studied you know all the world's documents and and text samples and it can use that to actually predict what text is going to come next. So you can go into this uh, into this uh, service and you can build apps around it. You can put a short fragment of text in and it can actually generate a paragraph, two paragraphs or a whole essay based on hmm. the fragment. And when you read it, you'll honestly think it's been written by a human being. But here's the weird thing. If you use that technology to power a conversation, you could be talking to the computer and you could think the computer's in love with you. You could think the computer's got emotions. But what the computer's actually doing is using statistical ana analysis to mirror your phrases and words in a way that actually almost makes sense. So you are reading those emotions into it. The computer has no idea of the real context, the real meaning of anything it says. It's just using statistics. So the big danger, I think, for us and this is something that Max, Max Tegmark, the scientist, talks about, is that we create something, an AI, that looks and talks and seems like it's conscious and real. But then we discover much too late that it's really just an automaton, something that's smart enough to trick us into thinking, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it has humanity. But it's, it's really just statistics and, and, and randomness. So I think it's a bit of a, to me, I think it's a bit of a false uh, target. Mm -hmm. I don't think our goal should be to be creating conscious, intelligent machines. I mean, everything that makes a machine useful is generally the things that are not human. Why do we need to invent an unpredictable, emotional and volatile machine and then put it in charge of something mission critical? I mean, the whole point of machines is that they can do the things that we don't trust people to do consistently. Well, let's talk about someone who has a, a conscious, who is conscient, uh, or at least we think, Elon Musk. Uh, his his power <laughs> to tell stories is very interesting to people, intriguing to people. What is storytelling's role in an algorithmic day and age? And uh, how important is it to incorporate storytelling into your business plan? So I, I think Elon Musk has two superpowers. Um, as you say, one is definitely storytelling. And, and, and you know, this is hardwired into us. Uh, in that classic book, Sapiens, the, the author speculates that one of the reasons why Homo sapiens beat up the Neanderthals was not because, as people think, Neanderthals were stupid or blockheaded. Actually, they were very intelligent and, and very resilient. But there was one thing that Homo sapiens, who were actually weaker and smaller and less physically capable, there was one thing they were better at, and that was gossip. 
and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of hardwired for sharing information about what was going on in the community, which ultimately became something which was very advantageous because, you know, yeah, you could be big and strong and kill a tiger, but if you could invent some new way of trapping tigers using some sort of spear technology and you were able to share that with other people, that community would be more likely to survive. So I think we're hardwired for that. And and visionaries like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, they know how to excite the human uh, imagination. So we give them a lot of rope, you know, and we give them a lot of latitude. And we believe, and you think in the end, the stock market is just a sum of our beliefs and hopes for the future. Um, so, so they're rewarded for that. But the real superpower for me, for someone like Elon Musk, is not just his showmanship. It's his ability to think and work from first principles. So if you tell Musk something's impossible, he'll go back and go, okay, let's reframe the problem. Um, uh, there's a great story I talk about in the book about how he attempt, you know, his first attempts at creating SpaceX were a disaster. I mean, he, he, he just sold PayPal. He was young. He had lots of money. He actually just thought about as a stunt sending something to Mars. So he was going to. He basically looked into buying, you know, some rockets. It, it turns out that, you know, you can't just go buy a rocket from NASA. Uh, but then he found out that the Russians had some, you know, right. intercontinental ballistic missiles Business, that they yeah. that they're willing to sell. I don't even know how that happens. How can you go buy ICBMs from Russia? So he went over there and they laughed at him and said, "Listen, you, these things are like I don't know twenty million dollars each, and you need two of them." So he, he flew back on the plane. He was like, "Kind of, how can it be this hard?" He thought. What actually is a rocket? Like if I was to take a rocket and break it down into its components and its kind of base materials and I was to buy those things on the kind of commodities exchange, how much could this thing possibly cost? And by going back to first principles, not only was he able to solve that problem in a way that people thought was not possible, he was able to make a commercially viable business out of it as well. That's first principle thinking. Yeah, I, I love that section in the book as well. What a story, too. Yeah, what are the components actually, and and, and what does it take to to achieve that goal? Now, uh, a couple things in there. Uh, Neanderthals go extinct, and then you said the Russian missiles, nuclear warheads, we could potentially go extinct. I want to talk about a, a real story that's happening right now. You know, one point four to at minimum, maximum five hundred species go extinct a day. It used to be five a year. Okay is there a false narrative? Is there something that we're chasing? We could get the XR we've talked about today. We could get all of this algorithmic thinking we want, but at the end of the day, we're on a path to the sixth max extinction right now. Even if humans survive, we could deplete all the resources in the world. What is tech's role in the climate change? What is tech's role in society and making sure the sixth max extinction does not erase ecosystems all around the world? For me, the starting point is we have to depoliticize transformation. We have so many transformational technologies at our disposal, uh, from power generation to healthcare. Uh, you, you know, o almost all our major problems. It's not that there is a technological solution, but there are technological tools that can help us better understand, track, and frame the problem in ways that are rational and objective, and are scientific. But somehow along the way, we've managed to politicize a lot of this uh, to the extent that people are not only suspicious and fearful of the very technologies which could help us, uh, opposing or not believing them become almost like a mask of honor, uh, a badge of honor. So I think we need to move past that because politics is very important, but politics should be about priorities and about values, and there are differing views on, on, on where we need to focus. But we shouldn't be having debates about the technologies and tools that can help us better understand. Um, and this goes for all sides of politics. So for me, I think we need to think beyond those immediate debates. We need to tamp down our social media a little bit and, and not be so outraged all the time at everything we see because we have to realize that these algorithms are actually designed to kind of get us worked up and to maintain our attention. And we have to stop being so nationalistic because, you know, ultimately to solve whether it's a pandemic or a climate crisis um, or economic development, these are global issues that require cooperation. 
embracing ambiguity, not being nationalistic, far-sighted leadership, a few traits of leadership excel. So, Mike Walsh, the last question I have for you today on the show is, what is your definition of a real leader? For me, to be a great leader in this new 21st century algorithmic age, we need people that don't actually feel like they need to be in front. You know, to be a great leader isn't to actually lead lots of people. It's to be a connector, um, a networker, someone that empowers, enables, joins people together in the organization and allows them at scale to do things which they or the organization by itself would not have been able to do before. So to be a great leader is to be a joiner. I love it. Well, Mike, just want to appreciate your time coming on the podcast. Hope you can stick around for some questions after from the audience. I know they've been waiting. But for Mike Walsh, I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, build meaningful connections, be a joiner, and always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, Mike. Okay, folks. Well, thanks for hanging on for Crowdcast and on LinkedIn. Uh, again, folks, this is the Real Leaders Podcast. My name is Kevin. Just want to personally thank you guys for joining uh, and Mike, of course, joining from Australia all the way across the world. Folks, it's a crazy day in 2020. Uh, but we've got a couple of questions flying in. Again, all you need to do is just ask questions in the chat box. Just enter. Make sure you have a question mark at the end so it'll pop up for me at the end. Okay. First question is flying in. Uh, this one comes from Julie. Uh, she says, our real job is to design work. Um, how, how should work be designed, uh, in the current day and age for small businesses? The great thing is that the tools that used to only be available to big corporations are now available to almost everyone for a monthly subscription fee, you know, 10, 15, $20 a month. So, you know, whether it's collaboration tools or, uh, project tracking tools, uh, I think the starting point for any small business, it's probably more important for you than anybody is to go, okay, what is this task? First of all, does it even need to be done? Second of all, can it be done by machine? Can we automate it? And third of all, you know, is there just a smarter way of, of, of thinking about this problem in general? You know, as a small business, you need to be asking yourself that daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, you know, and, and that, 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 that efficiency is more important for you as a question of survival than a big organization. Uh, another question came up for me that I didn't ask on the show today, Mike, and that was uh, a topic you mentioned in the book. And again, folks, uh, Mike just threw in the link on the chat box. Uh, the book is right here, The Algorithm of the Leader. I, I don't really like promoting things, but this is a book. Again, it's a dessert for me. I really like it. Um, one of the questions that I had for you was, uh, it's a, you said it's a winner's take all scenario. Now I'm listening to John Mackey today, uh, the author of Conscious Capitalism, Conscious Leadership, and he was saying, you know, we need to get away from this mentality, this warlike mentality that is the reason for how businesses may have started in the first place, uh, that or religion itself. You know, how do we get away from, like you mentioned, is a, a competitor a competitor or are they a partner? How do we? How does a leader, an algorithmic leader, look at a scenario like that? I think one of the key qualities of a algorithmic leader is the ability to realize they operate in an ecosystem. So the kind of the boundaries of the firm are starting to sure. disappear. Um, so, you know, your ability to build smart connections with the other participants in your ecosystem, whether they're your suppliers, your partners, um, regulators, um, other organizations that traditionally may have been thought of as your competitor, you need to kind of redraw those boundaries because it might be that, you know, you're competing in the retail space against them for customers using different strategies, but you're actually using their infrastructure because that makes sense. And this is the situation people find with Amazon all the time, right? You might be Amazon's competitor, but you're using their infrastructure. And it's it's not like it's uh, a, a, a traditional war or a conflict in the past where, you know, you'd get your Nike logo tattooed on your arm and, you know, it would be hell or high water, right? We, we're much more interdependent now. And, and that's okay because it's about the consumer and the consumer should have that power of choice, you know, without companies drawing battle lines. Interesting. Another one comes in from Donna Jones. She asks, how to best use this pandemic period to restore connection to natural systems in ourselves? Well, I can tell you as a personal answer that I used to travel 300 days a year. 
Uh, so I was, uh, I was, you know, probably only at home for like, you know, 60 days essentially. And, um, that was devastating toll on me physically. So one of the biggest shifts for me from traveling all the world and speaking to being in one place, getting regular sleep, getting better diet and, uh, you know, getting up in the middle of the night to do uh, webinars. Aside from that, it's been transformative. Mm. So I, I think this has been an interesting opportunity for all of us as leaders and organization to, to think about the choices we make, about how we structure and design work, and, and to think about balance. Um, so let's see what happens next year. But in some ways, I, I think this has been a great opportunity for many people to kind of reflect on their lifestyles. Now, Mike, I, I didn't get into your personal background. Where, what's your background, your experience? I know you mentioned in the book, you started out being a lawyer. How are you here now? <laughs> if you find anyone as a futurist, they usually failed at doing something else. So sure. I, I was, uh, <laughs> I, I studied to be, uh, I did two degrees at university, actually. I did uh, accounting and law. Uh, but when I graduated, um, I was meant to go work for a big consulting firm. But then the internet happened. This is the late 90s. And it, it, to me, in that moment, it didn't matter what you trained to do. It didn't matter what you planned to be. If you were not involved in the internet, you were wasting your time as a young person. Mm. Because for the first time, this was a industry where no one knew any better than you. I mean, experience was useless. Any experience you gained prior to 1995 was just simply irrelevant in, in, the, in that world that was being born. So that's what I did. And uh, I kind of never went back. And uh Probably the most interesting experience was was not just those early years of the internet. I spent quite a long time living in in China, Japan, Korea, India, in Southeast Asia, working in in um, in, in digital media. And it it long before the iPhone, it 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 gave me a sense of the world that was going to come, mm. a world where smartphones were going to transform our experience of life. So that's really what set me on this path. Boldest prediction for twenty twenty one. I, I think we're going to start to see the rapid adoption of augmented reality in our daily lives by the end of 2021. And this really depends whether Apple brings out their um, rumored AR glasses. But, but to me, you know, we're already, you know, the, the next sort of generation phones that are coming out have got LiDAR built into them, better object tracking. Once, you know, it was already a big thing when the when the the digital world uh, kind of emerged, but when the physical world becomes digital, mm. that's going to really rewrite the rules of, of of how we live, work, and play. Of everything, absolutely. Okay, last question, Mike, for you. This comes in from Andrew, and Andrew asks, Mike, I completely agree that we need to be data driven and to be comfortable with ambiguity, which I completely agree with. He agrees. However. <laughs> How can we find clarity in the data? There are so many outlets for data and research can be controversial. So basically, how should we be able to clarify what data is the best data to use? Data is not the answer. Data is the question. So data basically gives us a way of having conversations with other people in our team, uh, with our leaders, uh, with the people running countries about different lenses to look at a problem, and 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 to me, you know, if you're going to be data driven, you 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 have to first acknowledge that data itself isn't always as objective as we think. There's no hidden answer in there, because as we were talking about before, Kevin, you know, there are you can use data to sometimes prove different points depending on on how you slice it. But one thing is for certain: if data becomes the means that you're having conversation. It allows you to challenge ideas that have been considered sacrosanct. Right. It allows someone who hasn't been around the organization for a long time to actually make an interesting and challenging point that can maybe transform your strategy. It breaks down barriers of hierarchy. So that to me is the real benefit of data is it gives us a means, especially in a distributed organization, mm. of having real conversations about things that really matter. Great takeaways today. Data, do not care about your feelings, that's for sure. 
Mike, appreciate your com- uh, you, uh, you coming on the Reelers podcast today. Before we go, where can our audience find more about you? Uh, book you for a keynote session and, and uh, read that magnificent book. Uh, they can definitely check out my website at uh, mike-walsh.com. Uh, they can follow me on Instagram or Twitter. It's just at Mike Walsh. And if you want to see some more examples of my talks and my videos, just go to youtube.com slash Michael Walsh. I just put the link as well in the uh, in the chat. Links are flying in. We just want to thank you all for tuning in again to the Reelers podcast. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere we're listening to the podcast. Who knows where we'll be in a couple of years, but right now we're on Apple Podcasts. Go leave a review. Let us know what you think and stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks, Max. Thank you very much.